Welcome to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, where for 35 years we have engaged the public in reflection and dialogue on the key issues of our day from an ethical perspective. All forums are free and open to the public, and information on upcoming events can be found online at westminsterforum.org. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter as well. My name is Tim Hart Anderson. I'm the senior minister at Westminster Presbyterian Church, located on Nicollet Mall in beautiful downtown Minneapolis, and I'm the moderator of the forum. It's my pleasure to introduce today's guest speaker. Jacob Hacker is a Stanley B. Rezor Professor of Political Science at Yale University and director of the Institute for Social and Policy Studies. Born and raised in Eugene, Oregon, he graduated summa cum laude from Harvard University and earned a PhD in political science from Yale. He has devoted his professional life to researching and evaluating economic inequality, health care reform, and social policy. He was part of the team that developed the Economic Security Index, and he has testified before Congress on the increasingly perilous economic conditions of the American middle class. He's the author of several books, including his latest and the topic of today's forum, American Amnesia, How the War on Government Led Us to Forget What Made America Prosper. In this acclaimed new book, he and his frequent co-author, Paul Pearson, argue that the vital link between business and government has frayed, and along with it, the American record of social advancement and prosperity. Bill Moyers once described the co-authors as, quote, the Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson of political science. Perhaps we will learn today which of the two our speaker is. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, Professor Jacob Hacker. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I'm really pleased to be here in this beautiful space on this beautiful day. Um, I didn't expect <clears throat> Minneapolis to look quite like this, um, and I'm not referring to the construction, but to the 70 degree weather when I arrived. So it's a real pleasure. Uh, and I want to really thank the forum for having me because we're really, uh, Paul Pearson and I in this book are really trying to start a conversation uh, about what we see as a governing crisis brought on by not uh, using our government as effectively as we could. Um, I know Paul would have, Pearson, my co-author, would have loved to be uh, with you today, and I'm sure he would have told you that he's not Dr. Watson, were he with us. Um, uh, he is at the University of California at Berkeley where uh, they require that you teach, um, and <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. So. <laughs> So, so I've been looking forward to this, as I said. Um, I've been looking forward to this book coming out. I've been working on it for quite a while, longer than I care to admit. And the book came out just a couple weeks ago. Um, and the anticipation of a new book uh, is something that's hard to describe, but I think it was well captured in this perhaps familiar uh, refrain that before a book is published is the calm before the calm. Uh, <laughs> so I'm, I'm very pleased that, that I'm, I can keep the calm at bay just a little bit longer. So, I don't know how many of you have seen the cover of the book. If you haven't, uh, you can see it over here afterwards. Um, but, um, but it's a picture of the Capitol building with uh, this sort of smoke enveloping it. And it obviously suggests the idea that we've lost something, that there's an amnesia about our government. But it's an actual shot of the Capitol, in fact. Um, there is a power plant just a few blocks from the Capitol that powers that, that heats the capital and provides cold water. Uh, and, since, and, and up till 2009 was actually coal-fired. And it was the largest source of carbon emissions in uh, Washington, D.C. Um, why, why was this uh, power plant still spewing out coal ash um, up till 2009? Um, well, because the coal state senators, um, uh, you know who they are, uh, were, were blocking its, uh, its, uh, its switch over to natural gas. And I think that's a kind of nice metaphor in miniature for what we're talking about in this book. Um, we've made enormous progress in dealing with problems like air pollution, in part because we've used government effectively, and often because we've used government effectively over the objection of strong market actors who see profit in uh, off, off, uh, off, uh, shifting their costs and their uh, and their liabilities onto other parts of our economy and society. And if you go back to the 1970s in the United States, you would have seen that vividly. 
Um, most cities were uh, extremely uh, dirty and polluted, and uh, Minneapolis was no exception, though it was hardly the worst. Um, if you look at a shot of the Manhattan skyline in the 1960s, it looks a bit like uh, contemporary Beijing. And in fact, just recently in the Times, uh, a piece ran that used air quality in Beijing as a way of assessing uh, the, the pre number of premature deaths uh, that are due to poor air quality. And what the article concluded is that based on the efforts that we've taken since the 1970s, most notably in the Clean Air Act of 1972 and subsequent amendments to it, if you take into account the improvements in air quality that were caused by that uh, legislation and other measures, um, it probably added as much as two years of life expectancy uh, to the typical American. Um, that's just a remarkable number, but perhaps even more remarkable is the result in some cities that had the worst air pollution, like Phoenix, where it's roughly four years of additional years of life. Um, or Pueblo, Colorado, right? You think of Colorado as a clean, green place. Well, three years of additional years of life um, in, that, in that city. Uh, also, Wichita, Kansas, 4.3 years. Now, for those who don't know, Wichita, Kansas is where the Koch uh, brothers live and where their industry is located. Um, and I think there's something fitting that even the Koch brothers, though they oppose often uh, measures to clean up energy, uh, benefit greatly from the regulatory moves that the federal government has taken. Now, what do these examples tell us? Um, they tell us first that there are enormous benefits uh, to using public authority effectively. Um, and second, that those benefits come when we use government in ways that, that harness its distinctive capacities. And, and the way that I uh, describe this, uh, and I draw here on a mentor of my co-author, Paul Pearson, uh, Charles Lindblom, I describe this as, a, as the relationship between the strong thumb of government and the nimble fingers of the market. Now, as everyone knows, your fingers do great things. Um, but if you've ever tried to eat a, a meal without your thumb, you'll know that the thumb is great too. And you wouldn't want to be all thumbs, right? That would be pretty awkward, but you wouldn't want to be all fingers as well, right? And you need to have both to, to gain the kind of traction, the kind of counter pressure, the kind of uh, grasp that allows you to seize on opportunities. And it's the same with this mixed economy, mixed economy of government, and markets. Uh, and in America's history, it was the creation of an effective mixed economy that really transformed us from a country in which people had short lives, were very poor, uh, and poorly educated, and whose life chances were, were greatly constrained um, by the circumstances around them. Now, it's a time right now where we're thinking about things that have gone wrong, and, and there have been many. But I think it's worth remembering just how much progress there has been and how concentrated it has been in the 20th century. Um, and uh, that century witnessed changes in income and education and health that were truly unprecedented. Um, if you went back to the early 20th century, three in 10 children were dying in many urban centers uh, before their first birthday, right? Uh, with cleaning up of air and water and uh, milk uh, supplies for kids, with the creation of vaccines and effective vaccination programs, with the development of antibiotics, we saw a massive increase, right, in life expectancy from around 45 years at the beginning of the 20th century to uh, the, the 80 or so years that we enjoy today. And though, as you may know, the United States has fallen behind other rich nations in improving life expectancy, most notably, as you've probably heard, middle-aged uh, middle white Americans are now dying at higher rates than they were 10 or 15 years ago, which is the only group for which this is true, and we're the only country in which this is happening. But even though we have seen this regression, the larger story is of a massive expansion of prosperity that government's strong thumb helped make possible. The other thing that I think we tend to forget is that most of our leaders once understood this. Uh, our founders understood the need for strong central authority. Our, uh, uh, our great thinkers, Adam Smith, for example, uh, understood it. Uh, and the Republican Party, did a, a, at least a significant chunk of it, uh, as well as the Democratic Party, and most influential business leaders once understood it as well. Indeed, as I'll talk about today, the two pillars that held up the mixed economy were a moderate Republican establishment 
and a business leadership, particularly business organizations, that were willing to work with Democrats and with organized labor uh, to create a well-functioning mixed economy. They saw government and labor as, in the words of uh, the leader of the Chamber of Commerce back in the 1940s, as a useful and established reality. It was useful, uh, it was established, it was not going to be possible to turn back the clock on many of the, of the revolutionary changes in government's role that had occurred in the 1930s and during World War II. And it was also useful. That is to say, business leaders came to understood that government could play a vital role uh, in investing in research and development and basic science and infrastructure, uh, in providing basic social protections on, in education, and on and on and on. So in this book, we tell the story not just of how great, awesome the mixed economy was, but also about why it's begun to show its age and how these two pillars, uh, the business and Republican establishment, have ceased to be the kind of firm foundation they once were. So I want to start very quickly by reminding us a little bit about why we need a mixed economy and how it's made our lives better. And, and this will be very brief. Um, I heard that uh, last night that I couldn't use slides, and as a professor, I'm very dependent on them. Uh, but then I heard that Al Gore gave a talk here not too long ago. So if Al Gore can give a talk without PowerPoint, Jacob Hacker can give a talk without PowerPoint. <laughs> so picture, if you will, world economic history as a flat line running from about uh, well, the beginning of man, but let's just go back to, uh, you know, the beginning of, modern, of the modern age, from 0 AD or, uh, uh, to uh, 1900. You would see the level of economic productivity, output, consumption is basically a flat line. You know, there's a little bit of a rise in the 1700s and 1800s, but it is remarkable. The per capita GDP in the United States or in Great Britain, our, our, the other great power of the time, never rose above $5,000 per head before 1900. Now, as you know, per capita GDP is up around $30,000 to $40,000 a head. That is an enormous transformative change. And it's a change that we see in uh, areas as diverse as health uh, and, uh, and education as well. And I think the first thing that we should understand is that that change was not because we suddenly started pouring more capital into the economy. Um, you know, lately we hear a lot about this, the job creators. Um, you know, Eric Cantor tweeted on Labor Day, today we celebrate those who have taken a risk, worked hard, built a business, and earned their own success, right? Because everyone knows that Labor Day was set aside to honor business owners. Um, <laughs> So now, I don't know, it's a little unfair to, to, to bring Eric Cantor in after his ignominious defeat at the hands of a Tea Party Republican, but Cantor was a prominent guy within the, the House Republican Party. So what he thought was really reflective of what a lot of leading uh, 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 conservatives were saying. And what they were saying was basically that it was really uh, the entrepreneurial and, and investment activities of business, lead, business that uh, made prosperity possible. But the truth is that that was built on an enormous foundation of public investment and uh, public action. In fact, it's a bit like the, um, off, the often used joke that uh, Ann Richards used against George W. Bush, that he was born on third and thought he'd hit a triple, right? <laughs> it's a great thing to get from third to home base, but, um, but there's a lot that we've done as a society together that has made it possible for our great entrepreneurs to run from third to home. They include expanding the skills and capacities of workers. The United States was the world leader in both uh, pre-K, uh, uh, sorry, K through 12 education and in college education. Uh, we, we were light years ahead of other rich nations in expanding those opportunities and made for a much more productive uh, and as well much more civic society. It was linked up with the investments in science we made. Um, in the early 20th century, we were not the world leader in science. In the course of about 40 years, spanning roughly the 1930s to the 1970s, we emerged as not just the world leader, but really owned the rest of the world in terms of Nobel Prizes in science uh, and scientific and, and, and technological achievement. That was substantially due to the public investments that were made. Uh, the, the person who spearheaded those is now forgotten. His name was Vannevar Bush. 
He was a conservative Republican. Uh, under Ike, uh, he headed the National uh, Defense, the Defense Department's uh, Advanced Science Research Agency. And he basically said that the U.S. government needed to uh, step up its federal investments in science to a huge scale. Uh, and when we did, the results were remarkable. It was not just defense technology. Uh, if you pull out your iPhone, don't do it right now. Every major component of that iPhone uh, emerged out of government research, from, from GPS uh, to, of course, internet connectivity, uh, to touchscreen technology, to that annoying voice that keeps asking you to repeat questions. Um, that, that, by the way, is not the, the Siri is not military, but uh, voice recognition is. Um, and the point is not that we shouldn't lionize Steve Jobs for his contribution to this. It's just that he was on third base. Uh, and he got home because he was a design genius who brought these elements together. And that's the way the private sector often responds to the kinds of public investments we make. And now one thing you might think about here is that this is not a zero-sum story, right? Zero-sum means the pie is the same size, right? The story we're talking about is one about the pie getting much, much bigger over time and everyone getting, or almost everyone getting a bigger piece. Or, or George W. Bush perhaps put it better when he said, we need to make the pie higher, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> so the pie got a lot higher. Um, and it, it wasn't just that this non-zero sum element wasn't just that we invested and got big returns, it was also that more and more Americans were able to actively participate in this economy through education, through the opening up of opportunities for women and minorities. In fact, probably about a fifth of the expansion of our economy between the 1960s and early 2000s is due simply to the fact that the increased labor force participation of women and minorities. Now, let me just say, finally, before moving on uh, to the story of what happened, um, that the Perhaps the biggest, story, the biggest aspect of this was the improvement in health. And there is a lot of gray hairs here. Um, I have, uh, I must say, more than I did uh, when I started this book. Um, but, um, but the fact is, is that in this room, a lot of us honestly wouldn't be here in an earlier era. Life expectancy on average was 45 years, as I said, at the turn of the century. And it's not just that, it's also the enormous increase in capacity uh, of people at every age uh, due to improved health. And this, again, was due to massive investments, not just in public health and sanitation, which was the big first breakthroughs, but also in antibiotics, vaccines, and most of the technologies of modern medicine. Um, these were all hugely dependent on the National Institutes of Health, uh, a Vannevar Bush creation, and, and the um, and the other kinds of investments in both in insurance and in research uh, and, uh, and, and the infrastructure of care that the federal government spearheaded. Now, there's a sort of less um, sunny side to this, right? Another aspect of our improved health is protecting us from bad things that other people are doing to us. Um, and in particular, and sometimes from our own myopia, and the, the particular case here is tobacco, right? Eight million lives have been saved because of effective uh, tobacco control, and that has involved a lot of public action as well as private suasion. Um, late, you know, now we all recall the tobacco, now we all look at the tobacco industry as basically having been uh, uh, engaged in this enormously dangerous pr uh, pursuit, but that wasn't true uh, 40 or 50 years ago. It was a very big battle over a very powerful private uh, industry. Uh, just recently, the NFL, which is facing its own controversies over health, uh, wrote this to the New York Times. The NF this was after a story that um, suggested the NFL was using some of the strategies of tobacco companies to push back against concerns about concussions. It said, the NFL is not the tobacco industry. It has no connection to the tobacco industry, which is perhaps the most odious industry in American history. Now, I'm not a, a huge football fan, please don't come after me after this, but my co-author is, and he said to me, when the NFL says you're bad, you must be really bad. Uh, <laughs> okay, so a big part of using that strong thumb uh, uh, is overcoming the opposition of powerful private interests. That's one reason the thumb and the fingers have to be independent. And we saw that with cleaning up lead levels. Uh, in our cities, um, something that has been tragically uh, showcased uh, in a city that has high, high levels, namely Flint, Michigan. Uh, and that's also true with auto safety and a host of other areas. Today, I think we face many of those issues with obesity. And it's why it was so crucial that Republicans and business leaders were on board. So why are they no longer 
on board. What happened? In the book, we traced this massive change um, through two stories, or the story of two men linked, uh, linked by birth, um, namely George Romney and his son Mitt Romney. Now George Romney, for those who don't know, uh, was a Michigan governor. Uh, he was a blue state Republican. He ran for the president. Um, and we all know who Mitt is. Um, so uh, some of us want to forget it. Um, others are hoping that he will be the savior. Um, but he's a very different kind of political figure. What are the differences? Well, I want to talk about two and what difference they make. First, they were very different kinds of business leaders, right, and businessmen. Um, uh, George Romney was the head of a manufacturing company. Uh, he was in, uh, in the auto industry. He actually ran the Auto Manufacturers Association. The firm itself was embedded in the community. Uh, he once turned down a raise because he felt like it was, uh, it was too great for him to take it without a, w a raise for his workers. Um, he said as a kind of justification of that position that rugged individualism uh, is too often nothing but a political banner to cover up greed, um, which uh, is a statement that you would probably not hear from Mitt. Um, <laughs> he led the Mat Automobile Manufacturers Association, um, as I said, and uh, at the time, he was just one of the moderate business leaders who were operating on the national stage. The other big group was called the Committee for Economic Development. More about that in a second, but this was an establishment business group that was very moderate and very engaged uh, in, in working with uh, both, uh, both Republicans and Democrats on po projects, mixed economy projects. Okay, so fast forward a generation. Bain Capital does not look like a manufacturing company. It's in finance. It actually takes these manufacturing companies and slices and dices them up. Um, it's in a much more financialized economy uh, where the rewards for the top CEOs are much greater. Uh, and perhaps um, most important, um, the business organizations responding in part to the shift in the business leadership is also much different. Uh, look at the major business groups today. We've got not the Chamber, the Committee for Economic Development, uh, but we've got a, a successor to it, the Business Roundtable, which is, which is designed to be the kind of moderate view voice of, of leading business groups. The Business Roundtable how often do we hear about its activities on behalf of the mixed economy? Not very often because it's actually lost enormous ground relative to the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, the Chamber of Commerce, headed by Tom Donahue, who on his desk has a plaque that says, show me the money, because he's the most effective fundraiser in the history of organizations, uh, with the possible exception of the Koch brothers. Um, Tom Donahue has turned the Chamber of Commerce into a lobbying machine, uh, particularly for the most narrow kind of interest of small sectors of the business community. And I mentioned the Koch brothers. You know, whenever they come up, there's this kind of conspiratorial air. They're very openly conservative, and they're very powerful. And what they've created is a kind of shadow Republican Party. In fact, the Republican Party has really come to them um, through investment, not just in organizations, but in ideas over a long period of time. So that's a very different business community uh, than the one we had in the past. What about the other side of this transformation? What about George and Mitt Romney as politicians? Um, there again, as you, as you can already see, there's an enormous change. Not only did George Romney massively expand at higher education in the state uh, and support uh, public sector unions, uh, he also fought openly on the national stage against Barry Goldwater, who he saw as leading the party in the wrong direction. As he put it, dogmatic ideological parties tend to splinter the political and so social fabric of a nation, lead to governmental crises and deadlocks, and stymie the compromises so often necessary to pre preserve freedom and achieve progress. Sign me up, okay? Sign me up. The, the Romney for president, George Romney, that is. Um, so he was not alone, as, I, as we already noted. You know, the GOP at the time was very moderate. Uh, most of its leaders supported the mixed economy. Eisenhower uh, built the interstate highway system, invested in education. For the first time, the federal government took a big role uh, in that realm. He also uh, created NASA and, uh, and, and federal investments in science. And of course, um, he was also uh, a supporter of Social Security and organized labor. Um, I say of course because there's a famous, famous uh, to me at least, and I think to those who know Eisenhower's history, there's a famous letter he wrote to his brother in which he said, there are some within this party and there are some, you know, business leaders, you know, 
he talks about a few Texas oil men, uh, very annoyed you know, sounding, and he said, there are some of them who would like to roll back Social Security and, and take away labor rights, but they are small in number and they are stupid. <laughs> <laughs> So that was sort of the, that was the moderate Republican stance at the time. And, and the last progressive president in the White House before Obama, Richard Nixon, right? Richard Nixon passes the Clean Air Act, right? He creates Amtrak. He creates the Environmental Protection Agency. He does massive consumer and worker protections, uh, water quality and anti-tobacco legislation, and yes, another big expansion of Social Security. So when you come forward to the present GOP, and I want to be clear here, and I'm not going to talk as much about it, that this is a party, uh, both parties have been affected by these transformations I'm writing about, but the Republican Party has really been the kind of leading agent in the story. If you look at the contemporary GOP, you've got Mitt saying during the campaign, it would be popular for me to stand up and say, I'm going to give you government money to pay for your college, but I'm not going to promise that, crowd goes wild. And don't expect the government to forgive the debt that you take on. Now, I have a lot of questions about higher education policy uh, that are somewhat uh, qualified by my, the fact that uh, I am in higher education, but uh, the truth is, is that investing in uh, the college completion of, of American children, uh, American kids, is just an enormously positive thing for our nation, and we're falling behind other rich democracies. So it's one thing to say, well, the policies that we're using aren't right. It's quite another to say that this isn't something that we should be concerned about. And by the way, he said that to a student who was asking how he would be able to pay for college. Um, he, he also said, and this one I will not have to quote in full, he said there are 47% of the people who are dependent upon government who believe they are victims and on and on and on. Now, I don't know how reflective of Mitt Romney's own thinking this was. What I do know is this kind of rhetoric, which is kind of makers versus takers and Rand rhetoric, has become much more prominent within the party. And the, 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 there's a two sides of this. One is, you know, the sort of standard government is wasteful and inefficient, and that's something that's really uh, very much a part and parcel of rhetoric on both sides of the aisle. But this new idea that government is sort of parasitic on a very small creative elite, and the rest of society is mooching off of that elite through government, that seems new to me and quite troubling. And it often involves a kind of implicit or even explicit um, uh, sort of hint that those who are benefiting from government are not like you. Uh, they have different skin colors, or they're somehow not responsible in the way that the upright members of the community are. And of course, this is a party that has become much more hostile to government. So much so um, that I think it's fair to say that there is a kind of a doom loop of dysfunction that's occurring now in Washington where lots of useful things get bottled up or destroyed um, in the crisis of governance that we have. And then most Americans understandably are pretty unhappy about government and in turn reward the party that is uh, most attacking government, namely the Republican Party. Now, that hasn't worked so well at the presidential level and we can talk some more about it, but it's really notable given how difficult it has been to govern over the last 15 or 20 years and the degree to which the positions, uh, the ant sort of extreme anti-government position of the GOP is not held by most Americans, the extent to which the party has managed to gain almost a stranglehold on Congress and control a very large chunk of state legislatures and governorships as well. Now, with, We've got just a few minutes left, and I'm not going to leave you in a state of despair, I promise. Um, so let me, let me first uh, just say something that I mentioned earlier, which is this, is not, this was not the founder's view. I think when we usually talk about um, the creation of our Constitution, we, we do the kind of Seinfeld version, right? Uh, revolution, yada, 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 yada. Constitution, right? Well, there's something really important in that yada, 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 namely the, the Articles of Confederation. And this was this disastrous experiment with a central government that didn't have enough power to govern. It didn't have taxing and military authority in particular. And uh, since we're in an Alexander Hamilton moment, uh, I want to read a quote from Hamilton that is really exemplifies uh, the view that many of the founders had. And if I were uh, more talented, I would wrap this, um, <laughs> but I'm not going to. That's, that's not my strength. In the commencement of a revolution which received its birth from the usurpations of tyranny, nothing was more natural than the public mind should be influenced by an extreme spirit of jealousy. The zeal for liberty became predominant and excessive. The object certainly was a valuable one and deserved our utmost attention. But sir, 
There is another object equally important and which our enthusiasm rendered us little capable of regarding. I mean a principle of strength and stability in the organization of our government and vigor in its operations. It's a pretty good speech. Um, and uh, it's really reflective of what the founders were thinking, right? They, you need to have enough public authority to be able to do the things that only government can do, the kinds of things that made our country the richest the world has ever seen. Um, now, I would like us to get back to that constructive tradition. I would like us to be arguing, uh, but arguing about the right things. I would like us to be fighting, but then compromising on using that strong thumb in a way that assists and, and supports those nimble fingers. Um, the bad news, I think, is that we're a long way from that, a very long way from it. And there's no magic bullet. I would like to get rid of Citizens United as much as any card-carrying Bernie Sanders supporter. Uh, I would like uh, to see uh, a greater emphasis on allowing people to, have, to exercise their, uh, their right to vote. I would like to see organizational innovations that uh, let labor unions have more influence in our politics and that allow middle class Americans to join together. But that's going to take many measures, not just one, uh, and it's going to take some time. The thing that I think we tend to forget amid the barrage of negativity about government is that, as, uh, <clears throat> as I've tried to tell you, we actually have used government effectively in the past, and because we're not using it effectively enough now, there's a lot of money on the table. There are a lot of places where fairly straightforward things, like investing in our infrastructure or research and development, would yield a large return. I think there is a kind of uh, excessive negativity, not just among the public, but among media, and perhaps especially among the media, which right now is sort of fixated uh, so much on Trump that it can't write its normal stories about government falling apart. But I, I joke that the headline that you'll never see is, things are getting better, slowly, because of government. Uh, but it's actually the truth. And if we use government more effectively, they would be getting uh, better faster. Part of this pressure that needs to be brought from organizations and greater voter turnout and, uh, and, a, and a greater uh, emphasis on, a, uh, on changing congressional rules so that Congress can act uh, when necessary. Part of this is about creating pressure on today's business leaders to actually go beyond broad statements of support, but to specifically endorse an active and supportive government role uh, in our economy. It's really striking to me that Silicon Valley, which was more or less created by the federal government, is now full of people who more or less hate the federal government. Um, and it, it would be great if we had an organization like Itasca, um, uh, 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 or a mayor, I mean, or a, a leader like Mark Dayton on the national stage who comes from business backgrounds but understands the need for constructive government action. Paul Hoffman, the CEO of Studebaker, who headed the Committee for Economic Development, wrote uh, many years ago that the role of the CED was to pursue the following. We, the people, acting through our government, protect and strengthen our national resources, human and material, lift up the standards of health, education, and welfare for ourselves and our children at all levels of individual income, and mitigate individual misfortune and execute projects not appropriate to private action. That was a leading businessman in the 1950s. And it's not a bad slogan. Or as Paul Pierce and I put it more succinctly at the end of our book, the government that governs best actually has to govern quite a bit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob Hacker. You're listening to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, broadcast from Westminster Presbyterian Church on Nicola Mall in downtown Minneapolis. My name is Tim Hart Anderson. I'm the senior minister of Westminster Presbyterian Church and moderator of the Town Hall Forum. Our speaker today is political scientist and author Jacob Hacker. We'll be taking questions from the radio audience through Twitter and Facebook. Our Twitter handle is, is Westminster THF. And you can find us on Facebook at Westminster Town Hall Forum. While the ushers collect questions from the in-house audience, I'd like to thank the forum's generous funders and partners, including our broadcast partner, the statewide network of Minnesota Public Radio News, which is heard in the Twin Cities at 91.1 FM, and the media sponsor for our spring season, MinPost, 
a nonpartisan, nonprofit, reader supported source of Minnesota news. Visit them online at minpost.com. Please join us for our next forum on Thursday, June 23rd at 7.30 p.m., 7 o'clock, excuse me, 7 o'clock p.m., when Kathleen Hall Jamison will explore the topic, Campaign Speak, what the candidates are really saying. Look for further information on our website, westminsterforum.org. And now, Professor Hacker, if you would return to the pulpit, I will present the questions from our audience. We're in the heart of a very lively political season. Are the topics that you've been talking to us today about the, the collaboration between <coughs> government and business, are those topics we're hearing in the political campaign trail today? And if so, who's raising them? And if not, why not? Well, I think the answer to that is very brief, no, um, no, no. Um, and I think that's understandable, right? I mean, the Republican Party is engaged in a, a, what at least it sees as an existential fight uh, for its future. Uh, and Democrats, of course, have uh, a, a fairly progressive uh, uh, former Secretary of State running against a very progressive senator. So there isn't a lot of difference between them on some of the core questions about government. But, it, but I think it's revealing that uh, Hillary Clinton in particular has had such a hard time talking about her larger vision. And I think that's because it's not because she doesn't have a vision. Uh, and we, Paul Pearson, my co-author, and I wrote a piece in the Times where we talked about this basic dilemma that she basically believes that you should use government to address pub public and social problems, but there isn't a discourse in our current political life for doing that. In fact, on the left, most of the talk is about how corrupt our government is and taken over by the top 1%, something that uh, is clearly a problem, but I think can color too much our perception of much of what government does. And on the right, of course, there's, no, uh, there's not as much recognition, if, it, if at all, of the a vital role that government needs to play. So I think that is actually a big, big problem in our current, uh, in our current debate, which is that that there is no one out there uh, in the political leadership or in the business leadership that is starting to make the kind of arguments that we're going to need to become more predominant. And it's not a question of one person, right? I don't think one person can turn the tide. But that language and those arguments need to be part of our public discourse, and unfortunately now they're not. Question from a member of the audience here. Regardless of who becomes the nominee, have, has the campaign, either campaign, Republican or Democrat, had any meaningful impact that will cause Congress to effectively address income disparity between the 1% and all others? Well, I think that the, there has been a real change in the national conversation around this issue. Um, what's interesting is that Paul Pearson and I wrote a book called Winner Take All Politics uh, in 2010. Um, and it was, the subtitle was How Washington Made the Rich Richer and Turned Its Back on the Middle Class. So you can get a sense of where we were coming from. And um, what, at the time, this was not really a topic of conversation. Uh, the next year, there was Occupy Wall Street. Uh, and then, of course, it, it, now the Republican Party, of course, is roiling from the, from the disaffection of many of the, the less affluent portions of, their, uh, of, the, of the Republican base. So there is a real issue here um, that is really now at the center of American politics. It, it ranges from issues of inequality, like uh, the, 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 the runaway incomes at the top, to the just really fun fundamental decline in the standing of, of many middle class Americans and families and their families. And so I think that's going to be part of our debate. What I think is lacking for the most part, um, and especially on the Republican side of an aisle, is, uh, is a real recognition of, of two big constraints that we face. Um, one, I think, is just our political system right now is not working. And I will talk more, I hope, about why it's so hard to get things done in Washington. But neither uh, Republican nor Democratic presidential candidates have been forthright about the challenges that each of them will face in different ways once they're elected. And I think Sanders is, is, is probably as guilty of this as, as is Donald Trump in some cases. So the second thing I would say is, I know that's, those are fighting words, so uh, fortunately the questions are already handed in. The second thing that I don't feel like there's enough discussion, the second thing that I don't feel there's, a, uh, you're getting more. Uh, the second thing is, <laughs> <laughs> the second thing that I don't think there's enough discussion of here is that until people start to believe a little more in the vehicle of progressive reform, namely 
government, uh, we're not going to have action. And of course, a lot of this can be done at local and state levels, but it will require federal support. And right now, the federal government is essentially a wall in most of the big debates about inequality. One of our uh, listeners here in the room says, government spending went from 21% of GDP under Bush to 25% under Obama, and you think we don't have a mixed economy? <laughs> well, so first of all, the 25% is the peak under Obama when, the G when our economy was cratering and we were sp had spending mostly for, because of automatic stabilizers like unemployment insurance going up. Um, it's now, the long-term trajectory is, is actually pretty flat. And of course, discretionary spending, uh, given rising health care costs, which are the biggest source of our long-term budget problems, discretionary spending has been, as I said, declining as a share of both the economy and of the budget. If you look over the last 40 years, what you would see is essentially, uh, well, 35 years, you'd see real stability uh, in, uh, in government as a share of the economy. But I don't think that's the right measure that we would use. Um, so there's a number of reasons why we would expect for government spending as a share of the economy to go up um, in an aging society where health care costs have been rising uh, for much of this period at double digit rates. After all, as I said, the federal government, the, it is uh, in many ways, there's a, a great um, treasure, one of the treasury official who once said that the federal government is basically an insurance company with a military attached to it. Um, <laughs> the federal government spends a lot on health care. So that's not the best measure. It's an, and, and I just would say it's, it's, it's not about, their, we have not gotten rid of the mixed economy. In, I think inevitably you have to have a mixed economy. We're not using government effectively. Sometimes that will mean spending more. Uh, in many cases, it will be in spending less for better results. And the best case of that is health care, right? We have far and away the highest spending in the world, so much so that even though the federal government pays about half of health care costs, our federal government pays more than governments as a share of the economy than any other country, right? Uh, we spend about twice as much uh, per capita as most other nations, yet our health care outcomes are relatively poor. Um, it's no secret how those other nations get better outcomes with, uh, with, with more reasonable costs. They use government more effectively. Is it, in fact, a strategy of those? <laughs> That, I've mollified the Bernie Sanders supporters. <laughs> <laughs> is political gridlock that we see in Congress and elsewhere, is that a strategy of those who are anti-government to keep government out of business? Yes, I mean, so this is a point that I think often gets missed, is that gridlock is not neutral. Um, gridlock has a very strong uh, partisan and legislative bias in favor of those who don't want to use government to address problems. And one thing that I want to say here is that <clears throat> We tend to talk a lot about crony capitalism or takeover of government by the rich, depending on which side you're on. Republicans tend to talk about crony capitalism. The left tends to talk about the 1%. In both cases, though, we tend to think about it as being about making government do things for people. But in fact, a lot of the giveaways in Washington are when government doesn't do things, right? So gridlock has an enormous negative effect in areas where you need effective government action to ensure that the market works. Let me just give you one really big example, namely climate change, right? How are we going to deal with climate change? Well, we're not going to deal with climate change by trying to talk the Koch brothers into uh, emitting fewer carb you know, less carbon into the atmosphere. We're going to do it by making all of the actors who rely on a carbon-intensive economy pay the social costs of those activities, right? Which means putting a price on carbon, as the economists put it. That's only going to happen if the federal government steps in, and ultimately it will require, of course, coordinated action across countries. But ultimately, we're not going to do that without using public authority. So the point is that gridlock is not neutral. It's been very corrosive uh, to those who uh, want to use government in effective ways, and that a lot of the giveaways in the economy today are due not to government action, uh, but to government inaction, and I wish there was greater recognition of that. Now, how do you square the huge increase in lobbying expenditures on the part of corporations, businesses, with this view of a government that should not take action? Well, so lobbying organizations often try to stop government, so that's a big part of the story. But the other thing to say is that, you know, the, the problem with lobbying is, goes back to the point I made earlier. It's not how much you spend or regulate or anything else, right? It's, it's whether you're using that to, to defend broad interests, um, you know, what we, used to quaintly, what we used to quaintly call the public good, which I believe exists. Um, 
And if we're not using government right to defend the public good, but instead to pad the pockets of narrow private interests, then no matter what we're spending or however much we're regulating, we're not, uh, we're not see seizing on the opportunities embedded in our constitutional order to make our society stronger. And so I would say that the increase in lobbying is a, is a huge, both a symptom and a cause of, of, the, of the governing crisis we face. The other thing I would say is that lobbying is the antithesis of the kind of broad-based business organization that the Chamber of uh, Commerce once represented and the Committee for Economic Development represented. These were consensus organizations that operated at a level where they could articulate the interest of capitalists, not the interest of particular businesses, right? So what's good for, what's good for, uh, so, What's good for business is good for America. You remember that quote? Well, that's a really, actually, a quote that is misunderstood. So when the head of GM <clears throat> said this, what's good for business is good for America, he actually said he couldn't imagine that something that was good for America wouldn't be good for GM, that the, the, the two of them had such, such a deeply interwoven uh, goals, uh, goals of an expanded and more secure middle class, for example. So we've really gotten away from this idea that um, we need to act on behalf, not of particular businesses, but on the behalf of the ca of of a, a broader dynamic and a capitalist economy. And, and so I think in a lot of ways, what we're trying to defend, we think, is, a, is actually a very market-friendly view that recognizes both the strengths and the limits of markets. Uh, what caused the shift from George Romney to Mitt Romney, or, or maybe more broadly putting it based on what you've said and what you say in the book, what caused the shift from kind of an Eisenhower era yeah. Republican Party to what we see in the GOP today? Yeah, so let me focus on the Republican side of that because I talked a bit about the business side. I do think with business, we tend to underestimate the effect of financialization, by which I just mean the way in which corporations were restructured in response to the increasing role of Wall Street in our economy. And, and this is very fundamental, perhaps more fundamental than the globalization of our economy. And it's very localized in one period. If you look, it's basically between the mid-1970s and 1990 that you see this huge shift with corporate raiders stepping in, Wall Street becoming central to the re-engineering of corporations, and shareholders becoming at least on paper, the kind of primary goal, uh, maximizing shareholder value becoming the primary goal of corporate leaders. This kind of short-term orientation was not the, the essential element of business activity before that, and I think it's had really a number of corrosive effects on business and its capacity to lead. But on Republicans, I think there are two sides to the story. One is, of course, the rise of the South within the Republican Party. I won't say anything more than to say that when the South was solidly democratic, it was a real problem uh, for the Democratic Party reaching uh, consensus on issues, and it, it obviously shaped a lot of the policies that emerged under FDR and, a and, and, and later JFK. But when LBJ shifted the party behind civil rights, right, and shifted ultimately the Republican, the South to the Republican Party, that really transformed the ideological tenor of the party. But the next thing I've already mentioned is the degree to which the party has, got, has been able to gain by tearing down government. This was Newt Gingrich's explicit strategy. Mitch McConnell has cracked the code of American politics, figuring out how to essentially tie Congress in procedural knots and still win elections. And so it's this ability to win while still, um, while, while attacking our institutions of democratic government that is most notable and I think uh, most corrosive and perhaps most vulnerable today, uh, given what's happening within the Republican Party. We, we can hope. Government has contributed to this country's success, one of our listeners says, but has made many mistakes along the way. From $500 hammers to raising neighborhoods to put infrastructure in and destroy communities. How have these mistakes contributed to anti-government sentiment? Well, they certainly have, right? I don't think that people are, are simply responding to um, you know, fanciful um, perceptions of government uh, incompetence. There are really clear cases of it. Uh, what I wanted to emphasize, and I think I've said before, is that our argument is not about government always doing things right, but about the essential role that it has to play in an advanced capitalist society, and that in, on, a, on balance, and in a huge range of areas, uh, the effective use of that strong thumb of government alongside those nimble fingers has been a, uh, has been a transformative positive force uh, in our society. The other thing I think it's really important to understand is that some of the failings of government today are not due to inherent failings, 
uh, because there are some. There are some things government doesn't do well. We don't want government to invent iPhones because it wouldn't do a very good job of it. My iPhone would be dragging me down right now. It'd probably weigh about 15 pounds. It'd have like plastic on every, you know, on every corner to protect me. Um, so it's the point is government doesn't do everything well. But a lot of the cases where government should be acting and could do things well, it's tied up right now. Uh, and, and it's been torn down. The IRS, tomorrow is tax day. Well, technically Monday is because tomorrow's a federal holiday, but so for those who haven't, are, aren't gonna be ready tomorrow, you actually have till Monday. Um, but uh, tax day really should remind us, why do we want an IRS that can't do its job? I'm not sure who that helps. Um, it certainly helps the, the, the people who account for the one in six tax dollars that go unpaid. Um, but does it help us as a society to have an agency so hamstrung that it's not able to carry out its essential tasks? So the point is that by tearing down the capacity of government, we're often adding to the problems like $500 hammers uh, that get mentioned so often. And by the way, I'm not so sure about that one, um, if that's actually the case, but, uh, but we can have that. We can, we'll investigate. Someone tell me if, it's a five, if there really was a $500 hammer. We have time for one more question, one more answer from you. What makes you hopeful about the American political scene these days? <laughs> Long silence. Uh, <laughs> Well, I, I'm hopeful for two reasons. One, I think there's an amazing amount of ferment right now, um, excitement, energy. It's actually on both sides of the aisle. Um, uh, I'm particularly excited about the degree to which inequality uh, and, the, and, the, and, the, um, and the political inequality that's been caused by it are on the agenda. Second, as I said, the mixed economy did an enormous amount of good, uh, and I believe strongly that it could do so again. Um, that in, in many ways, the story we tell is a hopeful one. This is about, not about inevitable forces of globalization or technological change. It's about doing what we did in the past, using government effectively to address the kind of problems that only government can address. It's in our capacity. Let's go out there and do it. Thank you, Jacob Hacker.